The start in Egypt, where the continuing chaos in the country has been compounded further after the choice of liberal politician Mohamed El Baradei as interim prime minister was thrown into doubt by objections from conservative groups. However, a presidential spokesman says that no prime minister had yet been chosen. CCTV's Adel Mahrui reports. In less than a week, the Islamic Noor Party and the other political powers who supported Morsi's oust are divided. They didn't agree on the nomination of Mohammed al baradei for the interim government. al baradei has been nominated from the rebellion campaign founders, while the Noor Party has some reservations. We youth of all political parties support the nomination of al baradei for the government. He's a representation of the Egyptian revolution, and we won't be subject to blackmail from the Noor Party. Meanwhile, Egyptians took the street on Sunday to support a form of legitimacy. In Tahrir, they called it the people's legitimacy. The people went in huge numbers to stand against Morsi and people say it's a coup. So we are here again to show that we still insist on his oust and we support the new transition plan. This road leads to Tahrir Square, but at the end of it, there's another group of Egyptians who support a different form of legitimacy, which to them is a red line. I'm here for the Islam that is being insulted by this coup. We didn't come for the Freedom and Justice Party, neither the newer party. There is a president that we elected and was overthrown with the belief that Egyptians don't want him. This is a disaster. Those in Tahrir Square are not the only Egyptian people. We're here in front of you. To them, the return of ousted President Morsi to power is a non-negotiable term, and they will remain as long as it takes. On the other hand, within this week, Mansour will announce the new prime minister who will lead Egypt's new political transition. Adel Mahroui, CCTV, Cairo. Let's cross over live to Cairo for the latest development. CCTV's Famida Mila joins us from there. Famida. Thanks, Panina. Well, as, uh, as the sun sets here in Cairo, we've seen great numbers of Egyptians gather across Tahrir Square and also along bridges leading to that square. Uh, the numbers have grown tremendously over the last hour. We've also seen military helicopters and uh, jet and fighter jets overhead. And uh, there is concern that there could be violence breaking out. That is a hope, of course, that that doesn't happen. But we've, of course, got opposing rallies across Cairo tonight with pro and anti demonstrations pro- and anti-Morsi demonstrators rather gathering at different points. Now, our correspondent Yasser Hakim also had a look at the uh, increasing difficulties between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military here. The ouster of the Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi, in the last week by the military has brought the struggle between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army to the fore. The Muslim Brotherhood continues to stage protests as well as attack military checkpoints. And also, the Muslim Brotherhood has had a number of leaders arrested in the last few days with warrants for others also being issued. And this raises questions about whether the Muslim Brotherhood will in fact have to go underground to continue operating. Now, as I mentioned, Yasser Kim takes a look at this, uh, the frosty relations and the history between the army generals and the Muslim Brotherhood. The power struggle between the army and the Muslim Brotherhood dates back to the late 1950s when former President Gamal Abdel Nasser clamped down on the group after an assassination attempt on him for refusing to establish the Sharia law. Working underground for the next 60 years, the Muslim Brotherhood attracted thousands of Egyptians and increased their base through Islamic preachings and political struggle. They targeted the poor and desperate, offering them food, money and work, while posing as religious, pious people who represent God and Islamic ethics, a formula that worked brilliantly in Egypt and most Islamic countries. The Brotherhood became an underground international institution. The 25th of January revolution was the golden opportunity for the Muslim Brotherhood to surface and become a recognized group. They quickly formed a political party, the Freedom and Justice Party, and were ready to compete in the political game, ironically, with the help of the army. Under the military's cap to provision, all elections and ballots were won by the FJP. They achieved the majority in both parliaments and narrowly won the presidential elections. One of the first decisions by the democratically elected president, Mohamed Morsi, was to sack the military's top brass. In only one year, 
the Muslim Brotherhood moved from an illegal underground group into the undisputed rulers of the country. And their leader, Mohamed Morsi, became the higher commander of the armed forces. It was like a fairy tale into the making. But the fairy tale lasted only one year. A series of political mistakes and economic deterioration led to public outrage, which was translated into mass protests in the streets. The military was back in the limelight. Minister of Defense Al-Sisi, who was appointed by Morsi, deposed the president and installed the chief of the Supreme Constitutional Court as interim president to oversee the transitional period. The history is repeating itself. Just like in the 50s, the army is arresting Muslim Brotherhood leaders for inciting violence and killings, and even Morsi himself is under military custody. We now expect jihadists to escalate terrorist operations against the army in support of the Brotherhood. The group is now fighting back with mass protests and attacks on military checkpoints, opening a new chapter in the power struggle between the generals and the Brotherhood. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. In fact, there continues to be a struggle between the Muslim Brotherhood as well as the military here. The Muslim Brotherhood leadership, their spiritual leadership, saying that supporters should still take to the streets and they shouldn't give up, still hoping that President or the former President Mohammed Morsi will be reinstated. Now, another issue that is uh, concerning many Egyptians here is the appointment of a prime minister. What was expected to happen on Saturday was the announcement of Mohammed al baradei He was supposed to be announced as, pres as, as prime minister, rather, but that announcement didn't come. Late in the evening on Saturday, a presidential spokesperson spoke to the media saying that that had not been confirmed. And since then, there's been no word as to who could be in the running for that position. It's creating difficulty in Egypt in terms of this democratic transition, or rather ensuring that democracy continues and that uh, early elections, or rather fresh elections, are called. And that is to ensure also economic reform in the country, a huge point for the population here, considering that one of the biggest arguments, one of the biggest issues and concern in the last year has been a declining economy. So no word yet from the presidency as to when that announcement will be made and also who could be Egypt's next prime minister. Panina. All right, Famida, thanks very much for that. That's Famida Mila live in Cairo. Let's now head down south to South Africa and the grandson of former South African president Nelson Mandela has been removed from his post as chief of the village of Mvezo. Monday Mandela Mandela last week lost a court battle with other members of the family over the grave sites of three of his grandfather's children. The dispute has left the family split and many South Africans disgusted. CCTV's Guy Henderson has the latest. The Tembu Royal Household confirmed on Sunday that Mandela Mandela has now been removed from all of his tribal posts as a direct result of this dispute that's been playing out in the international media uh, with the uh, 15 other members of the Mandela family. Um, Mandela Mandela lost that court dispute, meaning that those bodies of three of Nelson Mandela's children have been now moved back from Vezo, uh, the birthplace of Nelson Mandela, uh, back to Kunu, uh, the place where he spent much of his childhood and had expressed in the past a wish to be buried. Um, despite losing that case, though, uh, Mandela Mandela shortly after um, convened a press conference in which he then strongly criticised those members of his family that had fought this court, court battle against him uh, and the local authorities seem to have seen that uh, as an embarrassment. Mandela Mandela was at, at one stage seen as a bit of a star, in, a rising star in South Africa. He, he was an, a, an ANC MP um, but uh, since that rise uh, he's been embroiled in, in a controversial uh, marriage dispute. There have been questions over his style of leadership in that chieftaincy post and then of course this latest very public spat has also uh, led to him being increasingly isolated. Um, saying that uh, the other side, other members of the Mandela family haven't got away without criticism during this dispute either. Um, specifically it now looks as though at least some of the case that their legal team built against Mandela Mandela may have been fabricated. Specifically um, words used by the legal team uh, in a document that was submitted to the court claiming that Mr Mandela was in a permanent vegetative state uh, and also that doctors had recommended that his life support machine be turned off. 
Now, that's something that the presidency, after that, those details came out, uh, then said was not, uh, was not the case and had, was not true. Um, as this soap opera continues to play out, a uh, very public spat in front of the South African and international media, Nelson Mandela himself remains in hospital in Pretoria. It's now been more than a month, and according to the presidency, he remains in a critical but stable condition. Guy Henderson, CCTV, Johannesburg. Let's take our first break coming up. Going green, environmentalists band together in the fight against deforestation in Zimbabwe. Welcome back. Zimbabwe's forests are under threat. Experts warn that the indiscriminate cutting down of trees for energy and agriculture could have devastating effects. Already, the country is estimated to have lost more than 30% of its forest cover over the last two decades. Alarming statistics which have spurred local environment experts to launch a tree planting initiative at a household level to halt the trend. This is Makoni district some 200 kilometers east of Harare. According to a 2012 population census, the district has 64,000 households. Environmentalists are hoping that each of these can plant at least 100 trees over the next 12 months, which will ensure 6.4 million new trees. Villagers are being trained on how to nurse seedlings and being given the inputs required in preparation for the tree planting season which kicks off in the last quarter of the year. We are providing uh, these pockets, plastic pockets, seed. Uh, that these are what we are providing to the people. The people themselves will have to have manure, well rotted manure, uh, river sand, and then grass. So these are the components. And uh, the place must be, have plenty of water up to about October. The uptake has been encouraging. It may seem like a small step now, but the launch of this program is the crucial first step in a program that will address an environmental challenge that could haunt Zimbabwe many years down the line. At the current rate of deforestation believed to be 330,000 hectares per year, Zimbabwe could be on the verge of desertification by the year 2056. Village elders, alive to the danger, have sprung to action, inviting partners to help replenish the forests. We are happy that this program has been launched because the forests here have been depleted by people using firewood. Right now, traditional healers cannot use traditional remedies from tree roots because they no longer exist, and even our children have never seen our indigenous trees. Beyond posterity, there are economic benefits. A large number of communal farmers are turning to tobacco growing. Wood-fired barns are now the most cost-effective means for curing the crop, compelling communities to ensure a steady supply of forests to feed this demand. If this pilot project is successful, it will be rolled out across the country. Farai Mwakutuya, Makoni, Zimbabwe. Nigeria's president, Goodluck Jonathan, will lead a team on a five-day working visit to China for the signing of at least four major bilateral agreements and memoranda of understanding. The agreements will be signed after talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping and Premier Le Qiang. Chimaronku now reports. Nigeria and China go back a long way. Since the two countries established diplomatic ties in February 1971, they have never looked back. Nigeria-China trade was worth $7 billion in the year 2012. 
by the time President Jonathan discusses funding of Nigerian projects by China's Export-Import Bank, the value of that investment portfolio could rise. The loans we are getting from China is the best out of the whole pack we've given so far. And we've analyzed it, we've, we've diagnosed it holistically. One is the fact that it is a very, very inexpensive facility. It's, it's 2% interest rates. It runs for 22 years. You can't get better than that. Nigeria is the most populous nation in Africa and needs $15 billion annually to fund its infrastructure deficit. China knows this and is ready to bridge the gap. One of the things we will also be discussing about is the fifth mainland bridge, uh, which will link the export processing zone in Lekki, where we're also planning to have a deep sea port uh, across the lagoon to Ikorodu. Uh, so we're also discussing that. The fifth mainland bridge is on the, is on the table. And uh, one of the things we have been enjoying from the Chinese, particularly those of them that are engaged by the Federal Ministry of War, is that there have been these exchanges. Sino-Nigerian cooperation has always been a fact of life. This visit will simply work out the details. China is the most uh, populous country in the world. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. And both of us, we have uh, great potentials. It is my belief, China and Nigeria, we can build our relations on the strategic manner. We, China and Nigeria, if we hold our hands toge together, we can march to the future. For this member of Nigeria's economic team, this trip is the cue for the awakening of the African economy. I think the time has come for Africa to realize that it has its own wealth. And all it needs to do is about value addition. And in order to create value addition, you need to reduce the infrastructure deficit. So we are looking for investments and partnership, economic partnership, in the area of investment in the infrastructure deficit. So we're talking about rail, roads, ports. It is time for the two most populous nations of Africa and Asia to form enduring and mutually beneficial economic synergies. Shima, Wangkwo, CCTV. Abuja. Now, as we've been reporting, the political crisis in Egypt has deepened further with Mohamed El Baradei's appointment as Prime Minister. And let's go back live to Cairo and get more insights from Famida. Thanks very much, Panina. Now, as we continue our coverage of developments here in Cairo, we're joined by Dr. Ehab El Khadad. He is the national. He's from the National Salvation Front. Welcome to Africa Live. Thank you. Well. well this, this evening, uh, Dr. Karat, we're looking at two different uh, demonstrations possibly going on. On one end, we've got uh, supporters of the June, th uh, June 30th movement, people celebrating the, the uh, removal of Mohammed Morsi. On the other, we've got uh, supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood who say they will continue with their sitting until he returns to office. How does political leadership hope to bridge that gap, hope to decrease the polarization across the Egyptian population? We have been into sort of a political blockage for uh, several months now. The, the, it was clear that people are unhappy, unsatisfied with what the president is doing, with what the uh, uh, Freedom and Justice Party is doing, and we were uh, suggesting alternatives. Now, the block of supporters of uh, Mr. Morsi have disintegrated. They have, the, there is only now the hardcore brotherhood who are with him. The, the brotherhood is not a small organization. They have maybe two million solid supporters who are, you know, who have cards, yani, who are membership uh, card members. And maybe 700,000 card members and others who are hoping because not anybody can go into their organization. The brotherhood is strong. All right, but he didn't win with this two million. He won with 12 million. Now, seven or eight out of these 12 millions were people who were against the old regime. They were not really pro Morsi supporters, but they were against the pro regime, including most of the people demonstrating now, because they said, "You are going to represent us as a revolutionary. We trust you because you you have a, a big organization, but you have to represent our claims." Right now, these seven million people were disillusioned by November 12, uh, 2012 and went against them. Now you have the five million, including the Salafists. 
few months ago, the Salafists left him. And they told him, you have to submit to the, 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 the voice of reason, uh, uh, change the prime minister who was doing very badly, uh, 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 change the public prosecutor who had a, a court sentence against him to, removing, uh, uh, to, to, to remove him from office, uh, be reasonable in what you do with the Shura Council, uh, the one I was member of the upper chamber of the parliament and uh, whom, I, whom I resigned from among the civil current uh, uh, members early on. And now, and now they are not with him. So he has this solid core of two million supporters and few uh, jihadis who are making uh, 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 allies with him. So what is the alternative for Egyptian people they, at this point? They, they will have to come to reason. They, they know that they cannot mobilize much more than the 100,000, 200,000 people down the streets. But the opposition have managed to mobilize, uh, in the least est estimate, 17 million. Some people say this is the largest human crowd in human history to be mobilized in the streets, to go out in the streets. So they will have to come to reason and say, uh, let's negotiate. I say that the road to reconciliation is uh, a transparency, accountability, and then reconciliation. We will not throw the brotherhood into, into the sea. We will not throw them into prison. So going but, forward, is there room for the Muslim Brotherhood to be included definitely. in the political environment? Definitely. They have to be included. We are already inviting them to come to the dialogue. They are still very angry of what happened because they thought they are still the strongest. They are straight. We are all uh, like, uh, you know, minimal, insignificant. We are mobilizing a few thousand people. And even when the crowds were filling the streets of Cairo, they said, no, this is not a real big demonstration. While actually it was on TV everywhere. I mean, people were filling the streets of Cairo, Alexandria, Port Said, Mansour, Al Mahalla, all the cities in, in Egypt. And for the first time, I think since 1919, the villages of Egypt went out. I mean, this is unprecedented. Now, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but looking at the National Salvation Front, there's been criticism that there isn't enough cohesion within the front for proper leadership. Is that the case, and how are you hoping to repair that? This, this is not true. We, are, we have been uh, uh, cohesive uh, since uh, November, since our formation. Uh, we, we, are not, we are a democratic front. We have different parties, we have different views, but when we come to a stand, we all uh, 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 yani keep to this stand. We are committed to it. Nobody went out of the line of the National Salvation Front, front for the last seven months since its establishment. Just wrapping up now, so beyond the removal of Mohamed Mursi, the National Salvation Front, what is the aim at this point? The aim is to form uh, 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 an efficient government and in the same time a government that would rapidly deliver on some of the revolution's uh, uh, demands. Now, everybody knows that we cannot bring in pr prosperity to the people of Egypt now. We have to say to the people, we have to respect the people and say we have challenges. This is our roadmap to, to, to deal with these challenges. But we need to rapidly implement transitional justice. We need to bring people uh, to, to the, to the uh, courts of justice. We need to uh, enact laws that are uh, appropriate to the transitional phase. And then number two, we need to uh, uh, amend the constitution to achieve real consensus. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the roadmap, of course, is already uh, announced about the political steps. But what we need to is to reform the security, establish security, bring in economic, uh, uh, not, not, not prosperity in a few months, but at least Certainly looking at yeah, reform. Looking, looking forward. All right. Mr. Um, uh, Karat, we'll have to leave it there for the moment. We're speaking to Dr. Rather, um, Ehab Al-Karat. He is from the National Salvation Front.